Hi, I'm Mike Steven and this is Gear Up. Today we're going to talk a little bit about snowshoeing. So one of the very first questions people ask is like, do I have to buy special snowshoeing boots? What can I use for footwear? So we'll go over that first. So a lot of times I use just a straight up hiking boot. So the exact same hiking boot that I'd wear in the summer, I can wear out in the winter time. I'm pretty hot blooded, so <laughs> I don't get cold feet very often. So you know what, that works for me. But some people will need some extra insulation for sure. And depending on what temperature you're going down to, I'm a fair weather snowshoer. Uh, so if you're going down to colder temperatures, there are some snowshoe specific boots um, that are more of your winter boot, have much more of a lining in them. They've got a heel catch for the heel strap uh, to go over and good traction -y sole, just like a regular hiking boot so that if you do have to take the snowshoe off and walk across a parking lot, you still have some good grip. Most of these guys are all going to be waterproof, uh, whether it be a leather waterproofing or an interior like a Gore-Tex or some similar fabric, technical fabric, uh, to keep you nice and dry. Um, one of the big things with snowshoes, it's very similar to cross-country skiing, is that you will stay warm as long as you keep moving. Uh, the big thing with it is it's a high output sport. You're constantly climbing, you're constantly moving. It's hard work. <laughs> so you should stay fairly warm. And if you are getting cold throughout your body, the big important thing is, is if you keep your core warm, that's kind of like your, your vital area is your, the core of your body. So if you keep that core warm, it'll keep blood flowing out to your extremities and keep you warm. Just like overdressing on your core will cause you to sweat and get cold on your extremities. So it's really finding that fine tuning of dressing properly on your upper body and then your feet and hands should stay uh, fairly warm, especially doing a sport like this where, where you're putting out quite a bit. Now we we'll get into the actual snowshoes. So in a basic snowshoe, what you're gonna notice is first thing on the bottom, the crampons aren't gonna be quite as aggressive on a basic snowshoe. Basic snowshoes designed for trail walking out in the community forest, um, walking on some crusty snow, some powdery snow. Um, and like I say, the, the, the heel crampon and the toe crampon are gonna be a little bit more basic on it. Um, this one does have a heel razor on it, but you can get snowshoes without a heel razor. Heel razors are basically uh, just when you start climbing up steeper hill so that you don't have to go right back down to the bottom. It's just much more efficient to use a heel razor and once you get used to using them, you'll wonder how you ever did without them. So they just flatten out for flat walking and then you can raise it back up. A lot of times you can use your ski pole to, to, to do that once you get good at it. The binding is another place uh, on a snowshoe where they uh, get, you kind of uh, usually have your good, better, best kind of story. What happens in a good binding is you've got a good closure system that you can kind of tighten down, a heel system that you can tighten down as well. The reason why they have two systems to tighten down is because if you're in the back country, you snowshoe into a nice lake or something and you want to have a, 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 a mug of tea, you want to take your snowshoes off, you take your snowshoes off, never take them off from the webbing straps. Always take them off from the heel strap, which is basically a hydrophobic. It won't absorb any water, so it won't freeze. Because what happens is your foot's nice and warm. This uh, nylon webbing absorbs a little bit of water. And then when you go to tighten it back on after you've taken it off, all the straps are frozen and really hard to operate. So the secret is, anytime you're out snowshoeing, always get out through the back. The, the toe will be still at the nice setting that you've hiked all the way in, slide your foot in, and then crank down the heel strap. So that's kind of the, your basic shoe. One other feature actually I can go over is uh, pretty much all the shoes uh, that I'm gonna show you today have uh, the ability to uh, dump the snow and pivot. So what I mean by that is there's a bar up here at your forefoot and as you stand up, so as you push into the snow, the snow collapses onto the deck of the snowshoe but as you step out of the hole, it dumps all the snow off. So you're not having to lift all the snow out of the hole that you've just made with your snowshoe. Next up, we'll go to uh, uh, this snowshoe. And this snowshoe is designed a little bit more for um, firmer conditions. So the person that might not want to go maybe on top of the mountain peak, uh, but wants to follow some snowshoe trails or um, wants to kind of be in an area that's got high traffic so the trails are basically already established. 
This snowshoe is all about grip and traction. <laughs> if you see, you've got these major metal cleats all the way down the side. You've actually got a heel cleat. This is unique to this shoe. So that when you're walking downhill, the first thing that contacts is the heel of the shoe. You've got grip and traction right away. So when you're walking downhill in icier conditions and hard pack conditions, the shoe offers a tremendous amount of control. You still have your massive toe crampon and you still have some heel. Uh, these, are, these are the plastic decking crampons, but you, see, uh, but you do have a lot of crampon grip. You weren't, you're not, the shoe isn't gonna shift sideways. The shoe is not gonna slide back. It's gonna give you a tremendous amount of grip. So this guy, obviously for crustier, firmer snow conditions, it's not that you can't take it into the deeper powder snow. It's just that this type of snowshoe is usually sized a little bit smaller, so you won't get quite the flotation you would out of uh, a shoe that's designed to kind of hit the mountain tops. If we flip the snowshoe over, you see you still have a heel razor. It's a little bit taller heel razor uh, on this one, um, just to give you, allow you to go up a little bit steeper slopes. So again, it's able to flatten down or raise up. This one's using BOA. So BOA, again, is a system that's uh, being used in all sorts of different things but opens up like that, push down the boa, and snug it down to wherever you need to be. Uh, a, a thing with boa and with your binding straps is don't tighten them down too much. You just want them snug. Past snug, they start to cut off circulation on your feet and give you cold feet. So um, uh, this guy has a nice padding underneath it. And people ask about this wire. It is a stainless steel cable on, on these boa systems they're not going to break. And if they do break, boy, I believe warranties that stuff for life. So it's pretty cool. Uh, you've got a lot of strength there. A little bit different system how it dumps. It's pinned here, but it's still, if you get into some soft snow, it goes all the way down. It's, the snowshoe is still going to dump quite well for you. People ask whether the plastic is durable. It's extremely durable. <laughs> um, plastic is uh, probably one of the most durable things on the planet uh, if it's made at the right durometer. So made soft enough that it can flex and move. And that's actually the name of this shoe is the Flexvert. So it's got a lot of flex in this shoe. So again, more your firmer conditions, but if you size up in it, there's no reason why you can't use this snowshoe in soft conditions as well. This snowshoe is called the Mountaineer. And the Mountaineer is targeted at going to the tops of, tops of mountains. So somebody that says, hey, I wanna, I wanna go right to the top of that mountain. And uh, I know it's gonna be hard work. I know it's gonna be steep. So obviously they're gonna have a heel razor on it. Uh, again, really aggressive crampons and teeth. Uh, lots of these teeth are angled so that it doesn't like to slide back as long as, uh, as well as these plates here. You're just pushing up against them. Uh, pivoting toe deck. A lot more padding up on, the, up on the toe piece of the snowshoe so that, again, you can really snug that boot in there and you've got good padding, good hold for when you get up into the high alpine. Uh, there's rocks sticking out of the snow. There's trees sticking out of the snow when you get into windblown areas. Uh, so lots of stability on the shoe for that. Uh, good durable aluminum frame. A lot of the shoes are going to have a very similar aluminum frame. Uh, it's not that this one's better. Uh, uh, aluminum frames are usually made out of 7,000 series aluminum. Unless you go to your really inexpensive shoes, then it's going to be a lesser quality of aluminum, so not quite as strong. Next thing up to bat is your decking on this shoe. The decking gets thicker and uh, stronger. Again, when you're getting up onto ridges and stuff like that, you're gonna see more uh, poking out rock and uh, sticks and uh, those tough alpine trees sticking out. Uh, so they make the decking a little bit thicker on these guys to protect, uh, protect the shoe against damage. But that's kind of your mountaineer shoe, just a little bit beefier in the binding, beefier in the crampon, beefier in the decking. Take you right to the tops of mountains. And again, how you size snowshoes is by the, uh, by the rider's weight. So snowshoe doesn't care how tall you are. It only cares about how much you weigh. So you want to get sized properly with snowshoes. A couple little things that make snowshoeing really enjoyable. Um, I think that poles are a must personally. Poles just create greater stability and also allow you to use your upper body to help carry yourself up the mountain. So um, I use a height adjustable pole so that I can vary the height depending on the snow conditions. If it's firmer, harder conditions, I'll have a longer pole so that I can use my upper body more. Uh, if the snow conditions are a little bit more fluffy, I'm gonna have them a little bit shorter so that I'm not up here above the snow and then pushing down into the snow, I'll run my pole a little bit shorter. So height adjustable poles are a really nice uh, thing for that. 
And the cool thing about height adjustable poles is that you can use them for hiking, you can use them for uh, skiing, cross country skiing, you can use them for a lot of different things. So they're a very versatile pole. But for example, this guy gives you anywhere from 115 all the way up to 145 centimeters. So you can get quite a variance of pole for different heights of people, different conditions as well. This pole specifically comes with a, a powder basket. It also comes with a, a non-powder basket. So this gives you the ability to choose if you're in deep snow, you can use this basket. It just threads on, uh, screws on. Uh, this basket for kind of like your lesser snow conditions or sometimes in the summer. In the summer, I run mine absolutely with nothing on it. Um, this pole happens to be made out of carbon. Uh, carbon just happens to make it lighter weight, a little lighter swing weight in your hand. Uh, you can get them made out of aluminum. A little more expensive one is always going to be the carbon. The aluminum is going to be a little bit less money, uh, but a little bit heavier. Uh, but that's kind of poles in a nutshell. And one of the things that I'll mention actually about poles is make sure that when you get a pole, get a flip lock pole. The style that twist you know what, they're prone to failure out in the back country. Uh, whereas this, if there's a problem, you can pick the ice out, you can deal with the problem because it's all external. The system that's holding the pole is all external. So use a flip lock system, or uh, it's just like a quick release on your bike seat. So that same kind of system, use that system because you can always uh, jimmy rig it or get it back, uh, get the pole in functional condition so that you can get out. The last thing we'll talk about is gaiters. Gaiters are kind of a nice uh, thing to have in your repertoire or your, your clothing so that you can uh, not wear a full-on ski pant on a warmer day. So a day that you're not going to be rolling around in the snow or uh, it's not snowing a lot out or there's less snow, it's nice to be able to wear a gaiter instead of a pant. So a gaiter will come up to kind of calf height, it'll stop the snow from coming into your boot, and it's got a tight drawstring on the top of it so that you can pull it, no snow is going to get anywhere in on the boot. Uh, for example, this is a Gore-Tex gaiter, so it's waterproof, uh, so making it waterproof, it's good for summer and winter. Um, a lot of people will use the gaiters in the summertime to keep burrs and stuff like that out of their boots, or if you're hiking in an extremely muddy area, believe it or not, gators are fantastic for that. Uh, the West Coast Trail is famous for uh, gators because you want to uh, basically keep all that mud from coming into your boot and then chafing against your skin. So a gator is a good thing to have if you're a backcountry enthusiast. Uh, you can use it snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, hiking, all those types of things. Hopefully we've uh, explained a little bit about snowshoeing and can make your snowshoeing experience a little bit more comfortable. This has been Gear Up and my name is Mike Steven. I'm Mike Steven and this is Gear Up. Today we're going to talk about some electronic stuff. A few little odds and ends that can make life a little bit more comfortable for you. Uh, either out on the mountain, out in the backcountry, or potentially even in your house. We'll do the odd one first. The in your house one. This guy is a new twist on a boot dryer. So it's a boot dryer that's definitely going to dry out your boots, but it also has a UV light built into it. And the UV light, what it does is kill bacteria. So it keeps the smell down in your footwear. So when you're finished skiing, you can plug this into the top of your boot, uh, hit the button up here. You have a choice of one hours, three hours, or six hours uh, drying cycle. It pumps warm air into the boot, dries the boot uh, without you having to pull the liner. It, but it also kills all the bacteria in the boot with this UV light on it. So keeping your boots fresh, keeping them dry, helping them to last longer, and keeping the smell down hopefully in your house. So that's kind of a neat little uh, one that you can use in your home to make you a little bit more comfortable. The next one I'm going to talk about is uh, heated gloves. Heated gloves are fairly common uh, out there. There's 
all sorts of different brands making them. You can get all sorts of different quality levels of them. You can get anywhere from like your basic kind of style ones right up to ones with like this guy with leather palm, lots of leather on it, Gore-Tex. So it's got all the features that any awesome mitt would have. The added feature to this uh, glove is that it has a battery pack in it that's stored right in the back of the uh, glove right here. So two battery packs that are rechargeable. And you basically just turn this guy on. You can see now it's functioning. Uh, so at red level, you've also got yellow level and green level. So you've got three different levels at which uh, it's going to be pumping uh, uh, electricity into the cables and keeping your hands warm. So the neat thing about this is for people with bad circulation, uh, this will actually heat you up instead of just counting on your body core to keep you warm. Um, you also look at it uh, uh, after you eat lunch in the backcountry, a lot of times you're really cold. <laughs> Having heated gloves in the backcountry is a really awesome thing. You may not use them every day, but the day that you need them, they will be worth their weight in gold. Uh, again, just hold the button down and you've got a regular glove. So if you're not choosing to use it battery operated, you can, um, you can turn them off and just run them like a standard glove. Uh, so you're going to get about a burn time at the lowest heat setting of about eight hours on this, at the highest heat setting of two and a half hours. So you kind of just gauge what you're doing that day and uh, it makes sense for a lot of people out there. So that's your heated gloves. We've had heated footbeds for quite some time and basically you can insert this heating element or heating pad into uh, a boot and you can um, basically you put this underneath the metatarsal head of your foot and it heats that fleshy kind of part just before your toes and uh, keeps you nice and warm in the boot. Uh, battery cable runs down the bottom of the footbed up the top of the boot and your battery sits right up on top of the boot. So there's heated footbeds. Heated footbeds, uh, again, you're about the same kind of burn times. Uh, at your high setting, you're not going to get as much time, whereas at your lower settings, you're going to get a full day out of them. One of the things that has uh, just started to come into its own is battery-powered socks. So they're building like a high-quality ski sock. Uh, but with uh, heating elements all the way down and up the back, there's a lot of heat going into this sock. You've got your little batteries right up here that you're going to be putting into the sides of the sock. You got your charger. It's a really simple system. The really cool thing about a sock versus a footbed is if you're a ski uh, <laughs> ski boarder, if you're a snowboarder and a skier, you can switch. Uh, obviously between the different uh, disciplines without having to change a footbed or anything like that. The sock just comes with you. If you go out ice fishing with your buddies, you want warm feet, you can do that. Uh, the other people that I've seen use these are um, uh, people riding horses. I guess you got to wear a fairly small boot to fit in the stirrup and uh, something like this will give you warm feet out there. Um, lithium ion batteries uh, have also come into their own. Lithium ion batteries are batteries that don't form a memory. They're they're pretty hard to beat up. So the big benefit of a lithium ion battery is that they last a lot longer, they're lighter weight, and you don't have to maintain them as much or uh, take care of them quite as much as the uh, batteries of the past. So the heated sock is definitely something that's, like I say, coming into its own and it's something that uh, a lot of people are really happy is there, especially if you have bad circulation. Because it's one thing if you get cold feet just due to uh, that you're a cold person, but if you have really bad circulation, no matter what you do to your upper body, you're just not going to get that blood flow down to your feet to stay warm. So with a heated sock, the heat is being generated in the boot and uh, you end up with nice warm toasty feet. Switching gears a little bit, we'll talk about a few other things that can kind of make you comfortable in the backcountry. For example, when it gets dark. Um, headlamps, man, they have come a long way. This little guy right here is firing out 300 lumens. If you don't know what your lumens are, 300 is a lot of them. <laughs> so 300 lumens, you would be able to see uh, as you're walking down a trail, you'd be able to see every last little thing uh, as you're walking. 
the faster you move through a trail, whether you're biking or you, you're ski touring or doing something like that, you need more and more lumens the faster you move because you need it to be shining further ahead of you because you're moving faster. Whereas for hiking, walking, 300 lumens is more than you would ever need. And it would actually work for skiing and stuff like that too, uh, for the most part. Uh, but to give you an idea, it's not that by 300 lumens that you're getting no battery life. At 300 lumens, just using some AA batteries triple A batteries, I believe it is, uh, you get six hours burn time. So even at that high setting. And the neat thing is that you can back down the setting uh, in your lumens and at your lowest setting have 125 hours. So and nowadays, uh, a, a headlamp is something that you should just keep in your truck, keep in your pocket when you're in the back country, because you know what? Most of the time you don't plan to spend the night out there, but man, if you do have to spend the night out there, being able to see your gear and be able to kind of formulate a plan and being able to execute a plan, a lot of times you need to be able to see. We're gonna transition into my last item that I'm gonna show you today, and it's a new twist on radios. So everybody's used to the radio that kind of looks like this. So just your radio that you're gonna have snugged in your pocket, uh, but how many times do you not hear it? How many times do you not want to reach into your pocket to grab it because it's cold out? <laughs> so um, sledders and backcountry skiers use this radio a lot. And the reason why they like it is a lot of reasons. One, you can put this radio into your backpack. So this is the radio part of it. You can put the radio into your backpack and keep it way far away from your transceiver. Every single signal you have in the backcountry is going to overlap and cause problems. So you want to keep them as far away from each other as possible. So you don't want your radio signal, your phone signal interfering with your transceiver, which is usually sitting at, uh, on this part of your body, either right or left here. The next uh, thing that I absolutely love about it is I keep the mic up right about here. I, I kind of put it onto my pack strap or you can put it on into a zipper. Uh, just clip it into a zipper. And the big benefit of having this mic is that the, the microphone is right up at your ear. So when your friend talks to you, you can actually hear it. You can actually hear it, believe it or not, over a sled engine. It's uh, quite, a, quite a bit louder than a regular uh, mic. Uh, you can control uh, your volume. You can control your channels right from here. And a simple key on the side to talk to your friends. So the moment your friend talks to you, you just grab a hold of your lapel mic and talk back. So it's really quick to stay in constant communication in the backcountry, whether you're in trouble or you just want them to see something really cool that's going on to the left of their line or to the right of their line and you want to direct them towards it. You know what? I hope some of these items uh, will create a little bit more comfort and a little bit more fun for you out in the backcountry, even in your home. Uh, I thank you very much for your time. Uh, this has been Mike Steven with Gear Up.